Hello, welcome to NPTEL NOC, an introductory course on point set topology part 2. Today we will have the last section on the dimension theory. Module 44, local separation to global separation. Recall that our study of dimension theory began actually in the previous chapter with a discussion of separation properties which we have named S0 to S3. Keeping in mind that we are going to restrict the class of topological spaces for those which are separable and metrizable and in particular T1 we have pointed out earlier that S1, S2 and S3 are some stronger forms of Hausdorffness, regularity and normality respectively. We may call this itself the first step in the passage from local to global. Moreover, the passage from SI to S3, S1 to S3, there is one S2 in between, itself can be viewed as a passage from atom to mass, atomic to aggregate or whatever you want to say, mini school to largerness and so on. A kind of local to global, that is also you can say is the passage from local to global. Recall that one of the first few results that we proved in the previous chapter is that Lindelof plus S2 implies S3. So that made S2 our central object of study. Next, in this chapter we adopted S2 to represent zero dimensionality and then inductively obtained its higher dimensional versions to define higher dimension manifolds. Then came the theorem 9.13 and 9.15 which you may term as another step toward globalization. Let me just show you these steps. So this was the theorem if you have subspace of metrizable space, separable metrizable space, then x has dimension less than or equal to n, if and only if given any closed subset C of x and a point outside, there is a closed subset D of x such that dimension of D is less than or equal to n minus 1 and x minus D is equal to A separated B. A and B are both open and close subset disjoint with P inside A and C inside B. So we have pointed out that in the case of n equal to 0, dimension of D is minus 1 means D is empty set. This is precisely the condition S2. Right? So similarly, the 9.15 Okay, we can also similar things. I just wanted to show you one of them. So here, if X is a metrizable space and X prime is a subspace of that, dimension of X prime is less than or equal to n, if and only if for every point P inside X. Now I am putting conditions on points of X altogether. You see, I am getting condition like that. Condition is uh, dimension of X prime is less than or equal to n. What is the relation between points inside X and point uh, the subspace being dimension less than equal to n? So that step is again another step towards globalization. This is what we meant. Okay. So let's go back to what we are doing today. So as the inventor inventor had termed it, the success of the concept of this theory of dimension, why I am calling this theory because there are other theories also, hinges upon successfully strengthening the passage. 
from local to global. This is the topic of this class section wherein we shall be able to reach our goal, the final goal of proving that the topological dimension of the Euclidean space Rn is actually equal to n. So, that I call it as a success of the theory. Here is the next step in the passage from local to global. Okay, so, we have to prove all these things now. Let x be any separable metric space, A is a subset of x of dimension 0. Given any two disjoint closed subsets C1 and C2, there exists a closed subset B of x separating C1 and C2 such that A intersection B is empty. The C1 and C2 are disjoint row subsets by normality you can separate them by open set that is a different aspect. Of course, that will be the starting point in the proof of this. What we are going to do is there is a separation okay, by a closed subset B which does not intersect A at all. Okay, so, this you can call it as really the crunching of uh, of course, we have to improve on this also of uh, you know the separation properties being you know globalized globalization problem here. So, let us start uh, the proof of this. We have to produce a closed subset B of A B of X contained in the complement of A such that when you throw away this B X X minus B can be written as disjoint union of clopen sets v 1 and v 2, c 1 contained inside v 1, c 2 contained inside v 2. That is the meaning of separation of x minus b. Choose open sets u i, i equal to 1 and 2 such that u 1 bar intersection u 2 bar is empty and c i s are inside u i. So, this step is just merely the metric space property here uh, normal as normal property of a metric space. Okay. So, that is all we are using here. Once we have this u 1 and u 2, look at their intersection with a. In fact, take u i bar intersection a. These will be disjoint subsets of a and a is of dimension 0. So, apply the S 2 property there. Okay we have a equal to c 1 prime separation c 2 prime here u i bar intersection a is inside c i prime. Okay. So, that is the de definition for uh, that is the property for uh, for the 0 dimensional state. Now, you enlarge the c 1 prime c 2 prime along with c i. So, you put f i equal to c i union c i prime i equal to 1 and 2. Okay, look at these C 1s are subsets of A, C 1 C i prime, C 1 C 2s are subsets of the larger space x. Okay. C i is are closed in C s are closed inside A, but A itself is not closed inside x. So, there is some problem here, otherwise f i would have been easily uh, you know you can take it as closed subset. Do I take the A as a closed subset? No, it is here this dimension 0, that is the point. Yeah. So, we shall show that F1 and F2 are mutually separated sets, which is stronger than saying just disjoint closed subsets. Okay. So, I mean they are not closed subsets, but F1 bar separates is does not intersect F2 and F2 bar does not intersect F1. So, mutually separated subsets. So, which is slightly weaker hypothesis than having disjoint closed subset. Disjoint closed subsets are easy to separate. So, this is little more. So, for here we will need more than normality, namely complete normality. Wait a minute. So, let us have this one now. How to prove that this one, namely f1 bar intersection f2 is empty. Indeed, once you prove this one, the other one is symmetrical, all these things are conditions are symmetrical in the other one. So, that will also prove exactly the same way. Okay. So, once you have that, 
use complete normality of the metric space, it follows that we get open subset W in X such that F1 is inside W and closure of W does not intersect F2. This is same thing as having disjoint closed subsets and so on. Okay, this this way it is easier to state. F1 contained is a W, closure of W does not intersect F2. You can then take B as the boundary of W automatically boundary of W is closed. So, this B is a closed subset which will separate F1 and F2 because F1 will be contained inside W does not intersect uh, B, F2 does not intersect B because it does not use W bar at all. So, F1 and F2 are inside that one. If you take W union complement of W bar that will be precisely equal to the whole x minus boundary of W namely x minus B. Okay. So, moreover if you look yeah that is what I have showed B intersection A okay, is empty because why I just uh, why this is uh, this I have not yet shown. What I have shown F1 and F2 are discharged from W. Moreover you want to ensure that B intersection A is empty. But B intersection A, B is boundary of W, boundary of W intersection F1, union boundary of W intersection F2. Okay, because this entire A is union of C1 prime and C2 prime, and F1 and F2 contain C1 prime, C2 prime. So A is contained in the F1 union F2. Therefore, this intersection is intersection with F1, union intersection with F2, but both of them are empty, okay, just now we showed that. So, this B will serve the purpose, alright. So, we have yet to find out that one. So, here is the, the schematic picture of what is happening. Started with C1 and C2, which are disjoint closed subsets, these ellipses then enclose them in open subsets u1 and u2 such that closure of u1 and closure of u2 are disjoint intersected u1 with a this is my say a is of dimension 0 that is why i have shown like dot 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 dot, dot here okay intersect that with a1 so that you get some subset here like this okay up to u1 here similarly from here to here all right so they are disjoint inside a and they are disjoint to subsets so you can separate them by c1 prime and c2 prime so c1 prime and c2 prime may go out of u1 you see they might they may be out of this one so it, it, here it might come even out of u2 also here to here and so on so of course this dot 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 sir dot 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 ellipses indicate that after all an open subset of subset of A is nothing but some open subset inside X intersection with A. So, that is what I, I have shown here. Then I put F1 equal to C1 union this C1 prime up till here, C2 union C2 prime up till here. I have to show that they are mutually separated. In the picture it is obvious you cannot use the picture to prove a theorem. Okay, you can take the help, but finally everything should be purely logical. Huh? And finally, what we want is this green thing W such that its closure okay, does not intersect this F2, C1 prime union C2 prime. And this boundary, if you take boundary, if you throw away that, you get a separation. All right. So let us prove first of all that these two, namely C1 union C1 prime, C2 union C2 prime, they are disjoint and mutually separated. Is what I have shown of injection. So let us do that. So it remains to prove 31. 31 is that this. F1 bar intersection F2 is empty. Okay, the other one is similar. 
So by symmetry, it's enough to prove that f1 bar into f2 is empty. First of all, f1 bar, f1 itself is c1 union c1 prime. Therefore, f1 bar, bar denotes now everything denotes happening inside x. Okay, closures are inside the whole space x. F1 bar is C1 bar union C C1 prime bar because it's just a union of you know finite union. But C1 is already closed, so it is C1 union C1 prime bar. Therefore, it is enough to check that C1 intersection F2. Okay, this is C1 intersection F2, and C1 prime intersection F2. They are empty. Then F1 bar intersection F2 will be empty. So this is the first step. I have to show these two things now. Just to show one of them, I have to show these two things. Okay. So let us see. Now C1 is inside U1. By the very choice U1. U1 is an open subset containing C1. Hence C1 intersection A is U contained in U1 intersection A, contained in U1 bar intersection A, but U1 bar intersection A is C1 prime. Okay. And hence. C1 intersection C2 prime is contained inside C1 prime intersection C2 prime. Okay, just now C1 intersection A is already in C1 prime. C1 intersection C2 C2 prime is inside the subset of A, so I can take intersection with uh, A itself. So that's contained in C1 prime intersection C2 prime, and that is empty to begin with. Okay, so. Instead of C1 intersection F2, I have looked at C1 intersection C2 F2 has two two parts, right? What is C2 and C2 prime? The C2 prime, okay? So C1 intersection. What we have here? C1 intersection uh, F2 will be C1 intersection C2, which is empty. C1 intersection C2 prime. Okay. So this intersection is now C1 intersection C2 prime. Now what is what is happening to this one? So C1 intersection C2 prime is again A intersection C1 intersection C2 prime. Everything is happening in C2 prime. A intersection U1 bar intersection C2 prime because A C1 is contained inside U1 bar. Okay. So, but that is contained in C1 prime intersection U prime, so that is empty. Okay, so I am more or less repeating this one here. All right. Next, to show that C1 prime intersection F2 is empty. Okay. So, how do you show? There are two parts. F1 bar has two parts, right? One we one we showed. The second part is this one now. This one we have to show. For each x belonging to F2. We shall produce a neighborhood of X which does not meet C1 prime. Then it will follows that that point is not in the closure of C1 prime because the whole neighborhood doesn't intersect that. If X is inside C2, there are two point uh, parts to F2. One is C2 and one is C2 prime. If C2, you can just take V equal to whole of this U2. For all the points inside C2, take just V because V, which is equal to U2 here, is contains the whole of C2. Okay, and then U2 is not uh, intersection uh, intersection uh, uh, C1 prime is empty, right? So U2 intersection A, which is contained inside U2 bar intersection A, that is contained inside C2 prime. And hence, U2 intersection C1 prime is U2 intersection A intersection C1 prime, which is contained in U C2 prime intersection C1 prime. That is empty. So method is the same, but argument are something different. That part takes one part. If X is in C2 prime, then what do I do? But C2 prime is an open subset of A. It's actually closed open subset, right? Because separation. C2 prime is also open inside A, so we get an open set V. This time it's a different uh, V I have to choose. Okay, so this V is inside X open such that V intersection A is this C2 prime open subset of A. 
then what happens v intersection c1 prime is v intersection a intersection c1 prime that is c2 prime intersection c1 prime okay that is contained inside that one so that is also again so separately we have shown that c1 prime intersection f2 as well as c1 intersection f2 are empty it just means that f1 bar intersection f2 is empty similarly f1 intersection f2 bar is also empty and that completes the proof now we can state a more uh, pliable statement and easy to remember statement start with any separable metric space take a subset of dimension less than or equal to n where n itself is finite of course i assume bigger than equal to 0 because if a is empty there is no statement that those things we have seen already so given any two disjoint closed subsets c1 and c2 inside f there exists a closed subset b of x separating c1 and c2 such that the subset a intersection b okay has dimension less than equal to n minus 1 Okay, so from zero dimension, we have come to arbitrary dimension here now. Okay, so how do we do that? Of course, X is a metric space. There exist open subsets U and U two such that C I is R inside U I, I equal to one and two, and intersection U and U two is empty. This is normality because C one and C two are disjoint closed subsets. Now, suppose n is zero. This n is between zero and infinity, right? So n is zero. There are two cases to be handled. If a is empty, in which case we can take b equal to u one union u two complement. That's a closed subset, and uh, x minus b is just disjoint union of u one and u two. Over. Okay, that's what when uh, when this is uh, zero. Otherwise. Dimension of a is zero; it cannot be minus one. Okay, in which case the first earlier lemma which we did just now that we give is the required result. So we have the inductive hypothesis here. Now suppose n is bigger than zero. Using a previous corollary, we can write a as union of two subsets d and e where dimension of d is less than equal to n minus 1 and dimension of e is less than equal to 0 this is one of the sum theorem that we have derived last time right now you use the above lemma to give a closed subset b huh, which separates c1 and c2 such that b intersection e is empty I don't know what is happening to D. We'll come to that later. But E part is empty. That is the the starting point with uh, n equal to zero. But then this implies if you take a intersection B, that will be now contained inside D. But D is of dimension n minus one, less than to n minus one. So intersection of uh, a, a intersection B is also of dimension less than to n minus one. Okay, so this after hard work of lemma, this comes quite easily. By of course, I have to use this crucial thing here, namely, anything which is of dimension n can be written as union of two subsets. One is dimension minus one, another one is zero. Now, in the above theorem, take a equal to well, this was. Not a theorem; it is a proposition. Doesn't matter. Take a equal to x. Then what do I get? Let x be of dimension less than equal to n. Then any two disjoint closed subsets can be separated by a closed subset of dimension less than or equal to n minus one. Okay. So no question of intersecting with a because a is the whole space x. Now, now we want to improve upon that one. 
let x be of dimension less than or equal to n and c 1 c 2 c 3 and similarly this c 1 prime c 2 prime c 3 prime etcetera pairwise disjoint close subset c i intersection c i prime is empty that is the meaning of that how many are there n plus 1 this dimension less than equal to n there are n plus 1 pairs of disjoint closed subset then there exists a closed subset b i there exists closed subsets b i how many n plus 1 of them such that each b i separates c i and c i prime and intersection of b i i ring from 1 to n plus 1 is empty all right so how do you get this one this is also easy from the previous theorem apply to c1 and c1 prime you get a closed set b1 which separates c1 and c1 prime such that dimension of b1 is less than equal to n minus 1 now use the proposition or the theorem we get a closed subset of of x again subset b2 separating c2 and c2 prime such that when you intersect it with b1 is a dimension is less than to n minus 2 because you already n minus 1 dimension now you keep on doing this you know repeat this step get a b3 such that it separates c3 and c3 prime which dimension of b1 intersection b2 intersection b3 is to n minus 3 how far you can go till you hit minus 1 and that is empty sir. So, you have to have dimension less than equal to n here and there must be n plus 1 of them then only you will achieve the half. All right. Now, you are very close to the end here. Okay. The rectangle or rectangular box minus 1 to plus 1 interval raised to n contained inside R n. Okay. Suppose you have C i plus and C i minus denote its faces uh, defined by equation x i equal to plus minus 1. If you just n equal to 1, this is nothing but C i minus 1 and C i minus C i plus is plus 1, that is all. If n equal to 2, there will be 4 faces, pair of 2 of 2 pairs of opposite faces right so that is the way you have to take these faces defined by the equation the coordinate x i equal to plus minus 1 ok now for 1 less than to i less than to n there are n pairs here suppose b i is a closed subset of j n bar which separates the opposite faces c i plus and c i minus it just means that when you throw away b i from j n bar you get two open subsets each of them containing c i plus or c i minus one of them containing the other this way okay, that is separation suppose you have got these b i's like this then we want to show that intersection of b i is non empty The crucial thing here is what there are only n of them. The previous theorem says if there are n plus 1 of such things, <laughs> then it is empty. So, together they are going to imply a big theorem for us. However, the proof of this is now based on something different that we did last time, namely Brouwer's six point theorem comes here. Okay. Let us see how. Pay attention to the method of proof because that can be used in several other places. Okay. Let D denote the Euclidean distance function in R. For each x in u i plus, I have orally told you what are u i plus here. u i plus is what? 
the open substrate containing Ci plus and this one is containing Ci minus, Ui minus Ui minus. Okay, for x belonging to Ui plus, let Pi uh, be the root, be the foot of the perpendicular from x to Ci minus. So, this is a one of the phases. So, go all the way to Ci minus from Ui plus. Do not change the ith coordinate, that is all. The Pi and x have the same ith coordinate, it is the foot of the perpendicular from x to this plane. Then, this is now elementary observation distance between x and Bi. Bi is a subset which separates the two things, right? Is less than or equal to distance between x and Pi. And this distance is actually equal to distance between x and Ci minus. Why? Because Pi is the foot of the perpendicular. And what is this distance? It is just 1 plus the ith coordinate of x. Okay. Similarly, so what we have proved by this one is distance between x and bi is 1 plus xi. Distance between you know x and bi is less than or equal to 1 minus xi for every x inside ui minus this is for ui plus and this is for ui minus. It's very easy to remember. Let me justify this one with a small picture here n equal to 2. Okay. So, this is minus 1 to plus 1, minus 1 to plus 1, the product square, okay, this is square. And this is C1 plus x1 coordinate, this is C1 minus, this is C2 minus and this is C2 plus. This is my B2, separate C1 minus and C2 minus. Take a point in U2 plus, this is x, take its projection onto this axis, onto this uh, plane. So, here is just an axis. What is it? It is uh, x1 coordinate will not change. What is its y coordinate? y coordinate of this point, or x2 coordinate of this point is nothing but this x2 coordinate here plus this one, the distance, sorry. The distance is, this distance is 1, this distance is x two right so distance between x and this one is same thing as distance between x and this part which is bigger than distance between x and b2 and that's precisely what we have proved x bi less than to x pi you see dx ci minus is m1 plus x now i define a function here for 1 less than i less than equal to n, define f i from j n bar to r as follows. If x is in u i plus, just take it as distance between x and b i. That is a continuous function, right? We know that. What is this? This is the minimum of distance between x and little b i, where little b i runs over b i. If x is in u i minus, you put a minus sign there. If x is in b i, put a 0. Look at this one. If x is in u i bar, it is this, u i plus it is this one. If it tends to a point, you know, if you take limit, it tends to a point inside the boundary, then this distance becomes 0, right? Similarly, this one also, this will become 0. So, by uh, these are continuous, this f i will be continuous because of that reason. Okay. Now, you combine these two inequations here, inequalities, <laughs> what you conclude is that minus 1 is always less than or equal to x i minus f i of x is always less than or equal to 1. There are two different cases you may have to work 
You have to work out this very easy. Okay? You have to just use this and this one accordingly. Because there are defini definitions are different. The function fi is differently defined. That's why. Okay? So, xi minus fi is between minus 1 plus 1. Therefore, if I define, okay, fx equal to f1, f2, fn and gx equal to x minus fx, then what happens? This is a function taking values inside Rn, but gx will be taking function inside Jn bar. It will be always between minus 1 plus 1, all the coordinates. So, obviously, both of them are continuous. Okay. Therefore, you have got a function from the closed rectangle Jn bar to Jn bar, we can apply Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So, we get a point x such that gx equal to x. What does that mean? fx equal to 0. What does that mean? What does that mean? fi of x equal to 0 for all i. What does that mean? x must be inside each of these di, which means x is in the intersection of here. Okay? So, so that is the statement here. Okay, this theorem is proved now. As I told you, now you can combine this with the previous theorem you get a wonderful result now tight thing namely dimension of j n bar has to be equal to n ok let me go through this one it is not so clear if not dimension is always less than equal to n because because of what we know that this part we have already proved ok dimension of r n less than equal to n and this is a subspace, so that part we have already proved. So, dimension must be less than to n minus 1. As soon as it is n minus 1, by our theorem uh, 9.38, whatever we have proved today, it means that so for each i 1 less than to i less than to 1, there exists n closed subset b i, which separates c i plus and c i minus, such that the intersection is empty. But Brouwer's fixed point theorem applied now just now to the previous theorem says this is non empty. So that is a contradiction to this theorem, right? 9.39. Therefore, dimension is tight, it has to be equal to n. Rn being a larger subspace of the, you know containing j n now, j n bar already, so this dimension is also n. All right. So we have proved that not only this one you can you can take now any open subset, any take any open subset which is homeomorphic to some uh, d n g n bar and so on contains something etc. Right? Any open subset will contain some uh, some copy of this one. Therefore, all open subsets will be of dimension n inside Rn, all non-empty open subsets of course. So, here is a remark, topological dimension, whatever you have defined, okay, is invariant for the class of separable metrizable spaces. We have not defined it for arbitrary spaces, that is one point you have to remember. Thus, we may also conclude that, you know, the Brouwer's invariance of domain, which is a weaker form of this one, weaker form of um, BID, so I am go going to give that, namely, Rn and Rm, if n is not equal to m, cannot be homeomorphic, <coughs> because we have just shown that dimension of Rn is n, dimension of Rm is m, but dimension is a homeomorphism invariant. Okay, this is a weaker form of Brouwer's invariance domain. Of course, the 
the real uh, uh, Brower's invariance of domain is the following, which is uh, which is a, which is a stronger form of this one, namely take any two non-empty open subset non-empty subsets of R n. Suppose they are homeomorphic, then if one of them is open, the other one is also open. And that is why the name invariance of domain. The word domain was used more often than just open subsets in the older days. So being open is the same thing as being a domain and that is an invariance. So that is why it is called invariance of domain here. Okay. Unfortunately, we are not able to touch this one. We have come very close, but there is still <laughs> a big uh, gap here. Okay. So, the proof of this will take us much deeper into dimension theory, which is beyond the scope of this course. The original proof due to Brouwer uses another topological dimension theory, namely Lebesgue covering dimension. In modern times, it is fashionable to prove this using homology theory. So, there are many proofs of this one, this great theorem. But a proof using only simplicial approximation, which is actually uh, part of it is there in Hurevich Walman implicitly, you may see in my book. So, here is a easy exercise for you, deduce 9.42 from 9.43, namely this I said is a this stronger form I said, why? So, prove you assume this and prove this one, okay. we have proved it using the whole thing, using the all our uh, you know first uh, two, two different chapters that we have studied so carefully. But assuming this, you prove this one, that is your exercise. Okay? All right. So, next time we will start a new topic. Thank you.